copy of the scriptures this morning and turn to the book of Psalms. We have been going through and uh, uh, stopping in different Psalms over the last 13 weeks. And uh, even with the Psalms, oh, let me tell you the one to go to, Psalm 40. And um, even within a Psalm, we don't necessarily go all the way through the Psalm. So for those uh, here this morning, if uh, you look down at your watch and I've only gone through three verses, don't get upset. You know, we'll be fine there. Uh, first, let's take a moment to pray, and then we'll take our examination from Psalm 40. Our Father and our God, we come now to the time of, of this week that has been building up to these moments. We have had many distractions. We have had many hills and valleys. We have had situations and issues to come into our life. And Father, it would be my guess that this morning that there are many of us who are going to need what you have for us from Psalm chapter 40. I would ask that you would focus our minds so that we are not distracted and that you would also, Father, give me the words you would have me to say from my studies, from my prayers, so that what I say is consistent with your word and builds up the body of Christ and glorifies you. For it's in your son's name I pray. Amen. We're going to be talking about patience this morning. Uh, I can remember way back when, and I would talk to a certain lady who is sitting on the second row to my right, on the far right, would tell me that, that's you, Mom, uh, that worry and anxiety was a sin. And she was right. Um, and that just kind of, you, you have to understand that in my mind, as I'm preparing for a message, there are a lot of things that go on. And uh, what I do is I start with the text and I begin to try to unfold it as I see fit, as the Holy Spirit hopefully is leading me. And so uh, I got to tell you, with Psalm chapter 40 and verse 1, I lasered in on two words. Two words really jumped out at me. The words waited and patiently. And the thing about that I saw with those two words is that they go together waited patiently i can i get waiting I, I i go to i go to red lights i go to walmart waiting is part of my life that patient thing uh just really knocks me around because you put waiting with patience and all of a sudden you've got a whole new dynamic going on well while i was doing my study and you've got to remember this goes now back a couple of weeks um, I did a whole week worth of study on those two words and writing and editing and all those kind of things. And I realized that I was being, that I was misdirecting myself regarding the first couple of verses in Psalm chapter 40. I missed the most important point of waiting in patience well into my study because I myself was being misdirected. Now it's not that waiting or waiting patiently is not important. That, that, that's very important. We understand that. It's just that I would, and here's a little illustration, I was building on a foundation that I had laid and not the one that was good, proper, and biblical. In other words, I, in my mind, I was thinking, writing, and studying to present things that were flooring, paint, and carpet, so to speak. And then I would like to think that at some point the foreman came up to me, Holy Spirit, and said, boy, you're missing it. So I kind of stepped back and I, I started looking at it and I saw that I didn't need to be studying and preparing for how to be patient, but rather I was to lay the foundation God would have me to, to understand, embrace, and present something different. So this is not a help, self-help message. It's not going to be full of pithy quotes and really cool illustrations and those kind of things. But it is going to be what we need 
to live life. So let's read together Psalm beginning in chapter 40 and verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. So if you see a little bit of difference, there it is. Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. David writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God these words. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined me to and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. You, and he's talking to God here, you have multiplied, O oh Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, and yet they are more than can be told. In those five verses, God is referenced 12 times. Now that ought to be a little nudge about the importance of, or what is important in these verses. And that is a hint of how to understand this whole passage because the words waited patiently are not the focus. And it took me hours of studying to realize that God is the focus of verses one through five. And by the way, would you not agree that when we come together to worship at whatever time, that the center focus is God? It's not us. And I, I've mentioned before that, that when I proclaim or teach or preach from the scriptures, my desire is not to, um, it, it's not to, to stroke your, your theological acumen or brains or thoughts or ideas. And the most important thing for me is, because I know it is happening right now, that God himself is listening to me and he is the audience of one that I am going to be talking to and about so that when I stand before him in glory and my life is evaluated, he will look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. So I want us all to kind of get in that mindset that what we are looking at here in these verses is the important, and this, this is almost one of those things that you would say is a, a, a not, you don't have to say it. It's almost like it's an, a given, but it's something that we need to be reminded of that God really is to be the center focus in our entire life. Mm -hmm. Whether we're at home, whether we're dating, whether we're working, whether we're at Walmart, whether we're hung up with a, it doesn't matter. Everything in our life is to be God-centered and God-focused. Now, with that being said, let's start looking at the text, verse 1. Because the focus of David with his waiting patiently phrase is God. Now, David does not tell us that he is waiting on God to do something specific in this text. Although we know that there were many times and there are many Psalms where David prays to God about specific situations and events. He's not asking God to defeat an enemy or lift a plague or heal someone or even to hide him from his, from his enemies. He is, he is looking to and expecting and wanting something better, more important, significant, and meaningful, which is an, an, an impetus for us to, to embrace that ourselves. Look at the first six words of Psalm chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for... The Lord. And oh my goodness, how important is that for every single, I started to say stinking, <laughs> for every one of us. I mean, how many times is it that there is something or an event or, or a situation in our life and we pray and we ask God and we think that he's a microwave oven? You know, you, at, in my house, you put popcorn in the microwave for one minute and 28 seconds. Uh, past that, 
You know, so we think we think God's like a microwave, and He's not. And we have to get to the point in our lives where we are waiting patiently for Him. And it's not necessarily for Him to do anything. I mean, think about this. Think about this. Now that now that I've I've gotten a little older and I have children and I have grand, we have children, we have grandchildren, there is an expectation and a hope that I have just to get to see them. And, and there is nothing like when I go to my grandchildren's house and they run up and hug my leg. They can, they're not tall enough to go, you know. They run up and hug my leg. Hey, Pops! And really, that's the way it should be with us and God. That we long to, we look for to be in His presence and to be with Him. David knew when he wrote this that any and everything he could want or have or desire was empty without God. I mean, how many times do we hear of, of people that are, are wealth, wealthy beyond measure and they are clinically depressed and some of them sadly commit suicide? I mean, if the world could bring the kind of joy and peace and happiness that everybody wants, those people would have it. And I was, we were driving up here this morning, Mom, and I said, Mom, do you realize how rich we are? Got a picture of Mom sent to me by one of my cousins from, I'm not going to say what year it was, Mom, to bless you. But, but my mother was in a homemade dress, barefoot, and the whole family, it was a black and white picture. And at that time, people, there were men, they, did, they thought that if you looked into a camera, it would steal your soul. So there's not a picture of my papa that I can remember that he's not looking off this way. And compared to them, I'm rich. Y'all are rich. Think about this. We got up this morning and it was air conditioned. Hello? We have clothes. We have food. Did anybody walk here this morning? Anybody? No, we, we got in a vehicle and we rode here. We're in air condition now. I mean, if you just think through that, all those things that we have are blessings from God. There is nothing that we have that is not from God. The richest person who has ever lived is a pauper without God. I was thinking that the poorest person ever is rich beyond measure with God. The healthiest person without God is deathly soul sick. A person, a person eaten up by cancer is full of life with Christ within them. A person who is alone but has Jesus is happier than the most powerful person on earth. An individual with only clothes on their back but has Jesus has real peace versus a person who builds bigger and bigger barns to store all this stuff. You remember that illustration? He built bigger and bigger barns. And God told him, thou fool, this night your soul is required of thee. And then who will these things be? Now, just kind of jot down if you take notes, Matthew 6, 33. You already had it memorized. You just may not remember it necessarily. But Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Can you finish that? And all these things will be added unto you. Wow. Now, specifically from David, what does God bestow on the one who waits patiently for him? Now, we're talking about the God element. I would suggest that what we have first in the second part of verse 1 is that God turns an ear to us and hears our prayers. Now, now, if you think through this for a minute, how many different languages are there on, the, on this rock we call earth? Thousands. And, and how many people who are believers are praying to God at any given moment? Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And yet, God hears each prayer as if it was the only one that he was hearing. 
And he pays that much attention and he cares to what we say and how we come to him and how we how we seek his face. And, and then not only that, the creator of the universe listening to us. Look at the second part of verse uh, of verse. Uh, let me see here. Wait a minute. Let me get caught. Look at verse two. Look at verse two. God gets involved in our lives. One of the things that we know that we understand from the scripture is not. Now, listen closely is not that God is with us, but he's in us. We are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, right? And so when it means that we are, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, it's not that he's with us or, or uh, comes to us. It is that he is in us all the time. Amen. He never, what is, okay, y'all remember this. Jesus will never leave me. That's Hebrews 11, 13. Jesus will never leave me, ever. And so we never have to be afraid of him leaving us. Verse 2, when it talks about God being involved in our life and how he rescues us from sure destruction, also described as the miry bog or quicksand, if you will. I don't think we necessarily need to take that literally, although there are times that God delivers us. I think that it is talking about the ultimate, the ultimate delivery from this nasty, sin-filled life. He delivers us from it. Where it says, look at this, that he makes our steps secure. I would rather have that. I would rather have God than every or any temporal blessing that can be named. It's also what we call eternal security. <clears throat> Or once saved, once saved, always saved. Now, let's put your emphasis on the right part in that. Once you're saved, you're always saved. And so what we have is, a, is God who is actually taking steps to seal us by the Holy Spirit. And so we are eternally saved from the wrath of God. And why is that? It's that cross. That's how we know God loves us is because he put his son on the cross and took all of our sin, past, present, and future, the sin of every person who would ever live, and he punished Jesus as if he committed them himself, even though he was perfectly sinless. And we have him. Our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Notice the focus is God in verse 3. The fact that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, it's not... Uh, noted in those phrases, but that's what he's talking about here. And the reason that we do not sorrow like the rest of the world that has, listen, there are times when I, when I have done uh, funeral services for people that I and the family knew were not saved. You want to talk about a hard funeral to do? That's tough. But you want to talk about the funerals that are easy are the ones where you know that a believer is with the Lord. Those, those times when you can, can say that we do not sorrow like the rest of the world that has no hope. There are some times when people should have tears and should be uh, emotionally distraught, mainly because they don't have hope. Now, for us as Christians, yes, we miss our loved ones. We weep, we cry. However, we know that there's something better coming along. And the better thing is not that we will see them when we get to heaven, but after we spend a couple of millennia with Jesus, then we can track down our loved ones, okay? And so that's the thing that we have with the kind of joy that he puts in, uh, in us. I mean, look at it. It says, we have a new song of praise that God, notice that, God puts in us. The reason we praise, the reason we worship, the reason we sing, the reason we, our hearts are lifted up is because of God. It's not because of this preacher up here jumping up and down and getting a little bit too mostly passionate maybe about these things, but it's because you 
personally have encountered God. He is abiding in you. And as a result of God being in you, he puts in us. You hear that? He puts in us joy, contentment, peace, hope, strength, and courage that this world cannot give, nor can it take from us. I mean, imagine, I mean you think about this. Put yourself in the worst circumstance you can imagine. And you know, ultimately, you're good. And it's not because of your parents. It's not because of your children. It's not because of the preacher. It's because of the God who lives in you. Who has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. When it comes to worship, the new song of praise that you see there in the text, God put in us. One of the songs we sang this morning, I loved, and I never sung it. Because I could read the words and I got the passion of the writer and the notes that were put together for the melody and the harmony and all of that. And it lifted my heart, even though I didn't know that. And the reason was because the Holy Spirit was in me, something that God put in me as a result of being in his family. One of the things, and do you realize how supernatural worship is? You know, and also, if you ever thought of this, how much Satan tries to mimic Christian worship. Here's how I say, here's how I mean that. Have you ever been to a secular concert? Anybody? I'm, I'm going to have to, God, I'm, I saw the cow seals. Who knows who the cow seals are? Mama does because she took me and dropped me off. <laughs> no, Dad took and dropped me off. And I wore velour bell-bottom pants. Thought I was something on a stick that day. But I also went to watch Willie Nelson while I was in college. And there were a lot of people that were happy and joyful and dancing around and singing. And there was an aroma. I don't know what it was, but there was a fog that just kind of, you know, permeated. Have y'all ever known what I'm talking about? It, sound, it smells a lot like burning leaves in the fall. And, and you know where my seats were? They were up there in the cloud. And, and I can remember going, wow, that dude can sing. But it wasn't because of him singing anything Christian. My heart wasn't lifted. And there were people that were just going crazy. Uh, euphemism. Because the adversary has tried to steal worship through rock. And, and I, look, I like rock songs. There are certain songs I like to hear till I listen to the words, but I just like the beat um, from the 70s and 80s. People need to listen. Those of you who have playlists that are later than the 80s, you need to get rid of them. And you need to go back to the 70s, possibly the 60s, and hear some real music. Can I get an amen? amen. Thank you. But when you worship God, there is something otherworldly that takes place. It's something that cannot be mimicked. It is something that stays with you as you go from that place of worship. It continues in your heart. And do you know why? Because God himself. The creator of the universe is sustaining us and encouraging us and strengthening us. And that's why we come to worship. It's not because we get our name written. If we come to worship to praise and worship God with our brothers and sisters in Christ that we're going to be with forever. You better start liking each other now because you're going to be together forever. Right? Amen. And we're going to be worshiping forever. And that's what David is talking about here. You know, and I'll even say, I've got a little bit here. There are times when I'm reading scripture, maybe I'm studying or talking with other believers or listening to a message, not one of mine, uh, that our souls are made joyful. There's something about the power of the Spirit and the Word of God that when we encounter Him in that, it, it, it elicits a time of worship. And then look at the second part of verse 3. Where it, it, this was a little enigmatic for me when I first read it. It said that many will see. You see that? I, I have, over the years, 
there have been times when I have taught and I've preached and I've gone through all these things. And, and it is so cool for a preacher to see somebody or a teacher, Sunday school teacher, it doesn't matter, to see somebody where the light turns on. And all of a sudden they get it. And they understand that this is the, the, the living word of God. And it's, it is like a sword that, that pierces to the very, very soul that we have. And to see that happen in a person is one of the greatest blessings there is. Because I know it's not Ron. I know it's not me. I'm not that good. If it was left to me, all of y'all right here would already be asleep. Hello? But it's because of who we are talking about and to and is here with us. Look, look, at, look at verse 4, chapter 40, verse 4. And if there was one that I was going to say, just underline this one, write it down, or ask, ask one of your family, and what verse was that that he made such a big deal about? It, it's this one right here, verse 4. Look at it. Blessed. That does not mean necessarily happy. You can be blessed without being happy. Happy is something that happens to you. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. You know why? Because everyone else, sooner or later, will fail you. Yeah, somebody say, I'll never fail my children. One day you're going to die. You won't be there for them. And so David understands. He says, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. People for whom verse 4 is true. Now I'm talking about observation, interaction on softball fields, with coaches, with players, with, I mean, you name it. I mean, this, is, this is universal in Ron's life. People for whom verse 4 is true are the most peaceful, content, serene, calm people I have ever known in my life in every single circumstance of life. They worship, love, and trust God in the storm as much as in the springtime when the breezes are blowing. After all, Jesus said, this comes from John chapter 14 and verse 27. Was it your grandmother that said, listen to that verse and singing? You said it a minute ago when you were leading worship. Yeah. Yeah. She said, now, okay, an aunt, auntie, whatever. A anyway, anyway. Listen to John 14, 27. Remember it. Because if you are a believer, this is a truth from the very mouth of God Almighty himself, Jesus Christ. Catch this. Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Here it is. Not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Why? Why? How? How can we not let our hearts be troubled or neither let them be afraid? It's because we have the peace of God from Jesus Christ himself in us all the time. So when we start going down that, that road of, of melancholy, we need to remember who we are and what the price was that was paid for us to have the peace of Christ in us. And so the question really becomes, and I'm, I'm saying this, I'm asking it for me. I'm going to ask it in, in the, in, for me. When I read a verse like that, do I believe Jesus? Do I believe him? Or is he just saying something cute? Or is he saying something he didn't really mean? No. You see, we have to believe Jesus here because the peace that he gives us is given at the cost of the cross for those of us who are believers. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus did that. I love the little caveat there, not as the world gives. And we've already kind of gone that way, so I'm not going to go back to it. But God's blessings are eternal and they cannot pass away. 
One more time, I know I've said this guy several times, but what's gonna happen to the universe and all the stuff that we have right now? What's gonna happen? It's gonna burn up, every bit of it. And he's gonna make a, what? New heavens and new earth, new Jerusalem. And so why do we embrace and hold on to things that are going to burn when Jesus himself has given us something that is far more abundantly great. Look at verse 5. We're about done. There are the manifold, innumerable blessings from God for his people. See where David says that? He in essence says, you know, I can talk about the blessings of God, but there are so many of them, I can't name them all. I mean, count your many blessings, name them one by one. If you really tried to do that, you would, you, you, you'd miss some, you'd forget some, you'd repeat some. And so what we're looking at here is that the gifts and, and blessings of God are so numerable that we can't even count them all. I think of Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 that is a different uh, context, but I love what, when you talk about the blessings of God. Malachi 3.10, God says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing you cannot contain it. Wow. So, when? <laughs> you know, I'm a preacher right now, I'm in the midst of some sorry uh, life issues and it's kind of difficult and I don't see any way out and, you know, I've been going through this for 40 years now. You know, when, when's all this cool stuff going to happen that you're talking about? Well, let me give you a couple of verses. Do not, you do not have time to turn to them. I'm going to conclude this morning by reading some verses to give us a time perspective <coughs> on what it is like. Now, obviously, it begins now with our salvation, understanding that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life from all eternity past. But then here are the blessings on a timeline of sorts from God. The more, first one, from Romans 8, 18 through 24, Paul writes, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, stop right there. Whatever you're going through, Paul's been there and worse. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. The best life is not now, it's coming. We eagerly wait. Ah, Paul had to have read what David wrote. We eagerly wait for adoptions as son, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope. We are saved. But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. He's quoting David. James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Where's our hope? It ain't here yet, but we know what's coming. It's about Jesus. It's about his return. <clears throat> Psalm 62, 1. For God alone, I love this one. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. I love how he uses that modifier greatly. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation and my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rest my salvation, my glory, my mighty rock. My refuge is God. Last one. Psalm 130 verse 5. I wait for the Lord. 
my soul waits and in his word I hope my soul waits for the Lord more than watchman for the morning more than watchman for the morning yeah David talked about waiting but we've already been given it partially because God is in us but you know what we're really looking forward to what we're really looking forward to is when I believe that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, nudges an angel and says, Hey, you remember that, that little score of music that I gave you to be practicing on your trumpet? Today's the day you blow the trumpet. And that time, when that happens, that angelic, angelic trumpet is going to signal the return of Christ. Scripture tells us that the dead in Christ will rise first, and then those who are alive and remain will be caught up to be with them in the air, and there we will forever be. With that kind of hope, why do we ever whine? Hello? Why do we ever gripe or complain? Follow me around for a week, and I'll show you what that gripe and whining and complaining is like and how I have to beat myself up. To not beat myself up, but remind myself of who I really am in Christ. <clears throat> the thing I want us all to do is when we look after we eat and we leave here and go to the rest of this week, month, year, and life, is to have a hope and a joy that is incomprehensible to those who are lost because we know Christ. Let's pray. God, we praise you and we worship you because we don't deserve a single bit of what we have been given. But I pray this morning that you will take your word by your power of your Holy Spirit and you will drive it deep into our hearts so that we don't forget, so that we, we remember always and that we live a life that glorifies you. And that we really do believe and experience and live what Jesus said when he said, my peace I leave with you. If, Father, there are any here that do not know you, I pray that you will open their hearts to your Holy Spirit for salvation, that you may be glorified in eternity. For it's in Christ's name, amen. Joel, what number? 538. 538, let's all stand. <clears throat>